You put that on ashes and dust, and he can now run. A, he can now run twenty five inches, or oh. uh, twenty one inches plus one inch melee. Or if you have the emissary, it's twenty four inches plus one inch melee for twenty five inch reach on an attack. And he has a focus at that point. Howdy friends, Craig here. We got another deep dive, this time for the Outcast Master Leviticus. These guys have a really interesting mix um, of expensive models for their core crew. I really liked hearing how they switch gears with ashes and dust when they need to and when they should. Uh, you might enjoy the part where they uh, talk about deliver a message and how it's actually a pretty good scheme for Leviticus. But there's a great piece that we do on schemes that you should never take against Levy. Now, we recorded this before Gaining Ground Season 1 was announced. And at the end of the episode, we do some interesting wish listing on strategies and schemes that we missed from 2nd Edition. We also talk about the current schemes and strats in M3E from Gaining Ground Zero that we think they should throw in the bin. Enjoy! strategy game allows you to unplug and test your skills against friends. Every week, Third Floor Wars delivers useful strategies, discussions, battle reports, and reviews to tabletop games like Malifaux. If you want to get better at the games you already play, or discover the games other people are playing, you are in the right place. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk broadcast. Craig here on the third floor. Today we're going to do a deep dive into the Outcast Master Leviticus and how the Amalgam crew works in Malifaux 3rd Edition. My guests today are Josh Antoline and Owen Best. You know Owen from the Terra Deep Dive. Uh, so Owen, welcome back to the third floor. Hey, it's great to be back, Craig. Really excited to be here um, for podcast number two, hopefully some more in the future. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. So uh, for those of you listening, we're recording this, um, uh, the I'd say the, what, four days, five days before the big grand tournament in North Carolina. Owen's coming down. You're bringing a couple of uh, your buddies with you. So uh, how are you feeling about this weekend? I'm super excited. We've been practicing missions for the last couple game nights, uh, I'm glad that this podcast is not coming out until after the event because we'll definitely be talking about some stuff uh, that I will be using. <laughs> Good. <laughs> what did you? Uh, out of curiosity, because I'm the one that put together the uh, um, the pools, and I can uh, since your uh, Nova pool masterpieces, I'd be curious to know what uh, your thoughts were on the pools. So I really like the pools that are in this round, um, especially. There's some interesting stuff with the, I believe it's round four is the corner round. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to create some really interesting strategic decisions. So I'm really excited to see what things people bring to the table in each of these pools uh, and really excited to hear some post event commentary after the fact. Maybe with me there, we'll see. We'll see how I do. want to think so. That. Uh, we just sent out the announcement for the meetup Friday night, um, so I don't know what time you guys are planning on getting here Friday, but we're uh, there's a really cool arcade here in Durham, North Carolina, that we're all going to meet uh, Friday night in, so I hope that uh, you guys get down in time. Yeah, we should be getting in uh, mid to late afternoon. So oh, perfect. Yeah, Jeff and I are carpooling down. Excellent, excellent. So we'll see you guys at Boxcar then. Absolutely. All right, good. Uh, so, Josh, this is your first time on the show. Welcome to the third floor. Thank you for having me. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Thanks, man. So, Josh, uh, yeah, then you're familiar with the first question I give new guests is, uh, how did you find tabletop gaming and specifically Malifaux? Well, tabletop gaming, it came in slightly later than a lot of my friends. I have been playing like RPGs and stuff with the same group of people since college. And uh, That's so cool. I had left to go to grad school, and when I moved back uh, to the area, uh, they were talking about this miniatures game that they picked up, uh, and that was Malifaux. Some of them were old 40k players, and they were excited to go from like the army scale games down to the tabletop or the uh, skirmish scale games. So I was like, 
sure, that sounds like a good time. And uh, pick that up and have been playing the same masters that I first purchased ever since. Oh, no kidding. So so how big is your uh, your corral? So how many different masters are in your rotation? So I have everyone in Rezzers except for Von Stuck. Nice. Uh, I have Misaki and Yan Lo out of 10 Thunders uh, because ninjas are awesome and Yan Lo is a Rezzer. Uh, and I have Leviticus and Jack Daw. And I may have I may have randomly acquired a Terra crew and a Vix crew over the years, so I have a lot. But Very primarily, nice. Very cool. So what we're going to do, guys, is um, we're going to try to give uh, the listeners kind of a feel for you know how Leviticus works, how uh, how his crew works. We're going to try to get an understanding of how you guys not only approach levy but um you know how do you build a crew so what are what are kind of the core models that you always seem to bring what are some of the tech pieces you bring in based on the strategy and scheme pools and uh, we'll even talk about how you counter levy and i have a feeling there's a lot of people that are anxious to hear that because uh you're starting to hear chatter about how good levy is so owen let's start with you let's pretend that people listening right now have never played against levy they never uh experienced levy in 2e and uh they really don't know what he does can you give us kind of an overview or a feel of what kind of master he is absolutely so in my opinion levy is a damage dealing and mobility master so but in a slightly different way than the vix the outcasts are definitely uh, a faction that is not hurting for damage output, but Levy brings it to the table in a ranged fashion himself, but also with some strong melee action from his key models. So he has a good mix of damage dealing. He has some pretty powerful mobility tricks, which we will get into in the next level play section. Uh, and he has also some very interesting uh, mechanics around using the health totals of his models as a resource that I think is really unique to him in this new edition. Yeah, that sets him aside or sets him apart. I think I agree. Uh, Josh, can we kind of cover some of his uh, kind of his main mechanic or signature abilities? So anyone who's familiar with Leviticus from uh, second edition and first edition will be familiar with like the two iconic abilities that he has maintained uh, into this edition. The first being uh, his new demise effect, Pariah's Soul, which is his ability whenever he dies uh, to teleport near a hollow wave, which are his totems, and uh, heal most of his wounds back and kill the wave in the process. Uh, so this basically gives him two extra lives over the course of the game, as long as you can keep your hollow waves alive. Uh, and the other big iconic ability that he had, uh, this is more of the second ed, ed ability, is Channel, where he can hurt himself through two uh, irreducible damage to himself to get sort of a pseudo-focus. He gets a plus to the attack and damage flip that notably stacks with focus. So I think that's a big thing to, to, to point out, Josh, is that it's not called focus, even though the effect is on top of focus. So that's a really mm -hmm. important call out. So you can stack the two on top of each other. And this lets him uh, have very accurate attacks. Uh, good chance of getting a damage flip that's cheatable. It lets him get around defensive features like manipulative or serene countenance and also fire into melee or into cover or uh, concealment rather. Um, and not suffer the penalties to the same extent uh, many people will. Yeah. So, Owen, we, we, I th we have to really start with his offensive abilities. So can we kind of go over his attack actions and uh, how he's going to be deleting models off the table? Absolutely. So uh, his first main ability is similar to what he had in second edition, and that's his unmaking attack. The theme of Leviticus is that he is a necromancer out in the wastes who is dealing with entropy, the concept of life and death. And so all of his attacks revolve around names like unmaking, death touch. Um, and so his unmaking attack is a range 12 stat six versus willpower attack that does two, three, four irreducible damage that ignores hard to kill. So, so good. It's very good. And, and you may be thinking, well, a min two on a master that doesn't actually seem that great, but it's the irreducible that's key because in this edition, irreducible gets past soul stones. It gets past armor. 
It gets past shielded. Basically, any ability that would be protecting key models, where the model really depends on some sort of damage reduction, Leviticus doesn't care. And with that channel that Josh mentioned, he's also likely to be hitting a higher uh, damage amount. Yeah, and that ignoring hard to kill needs a special call out there because it's very rare. In fact, that's the only instance I can think of where I'm seeing irreducible and ignores hard to kill, which means, which means you've got nothing. So his second attack is death touch. That's a range one melee attack, stat five, again, two, three, four damage, irreducible. This time, though, it has a key trigger that really can ramp up the damage. He has a built-in crow trigger where he can choose to suffer up to two damage to himself to deal that much extra damage in his attack. So if he chooses to suffer two damage, his damage track becomes four, five, six irreducible. Ugh. That is brutal. And with that channel, he is very likely to hit and he is very likely to be doing a higher damage or be cheatable. Yeah, and, and if he's not hitting, he's draining your hand. Exactly, because you do not want to get hit by that. Yeah. Now, question for you though, it um, and I did not. I faced I faced Levy more in three than I did in two. Um, what I always remember him in two is just being a, a range threat, but it really seems to me like it's a little bit different now that Levy almost wants to get in the mix more. So it's actually interesting. In some ways, it's a throwback to the beginning of second edition. So before, for those of you who haven't played a long time in Malifaux, uh, early on, Leviticus's channel ability in second edition had uh, basically applied to both of the attacks from the charge action. So that meant that he could channel once and get two focused attacks. This made it very effective for him to be fighting in melee. And so he was actually primarily a melee master. Got until it. Weird said, this wasn't really what we intended. Completely nerfed channel to once per turn and doesn't affect charge. And that basically changed him over to a ranged master instead. So, Got it. So this is like coming home to that mix of range and melee. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit, um, uh, uh, Josh. Uh, actually, Josh, y y go ahead. Your thoughts. Oh, it was more of just the thing about the, the throwback. Uh, the second edition Leviticus also had the extremely swingy damage spread. Yeah. Where the severe was like eight or something silly like that. So this being able to be a credible melee threat is, is it gets to, uh, some, some old school Leviticus action. Yeah, that's cool. So Josh, um, you know, obviously now we've got a situation where he's got the mobility um, he's got the demise ability. He's got the extra resource of his health to manage in order to increase his damage output. I'd be curious to know, you know, what's keeping him on the table? Does he have some defensive abilities that's keeping him there? So the I think the big change from second to third, in my opinion, for how Leviticus works, is that they did add a bunch of interesting layered defensive capabilities onto Leviticus and actually the whole crew as a unit um, that make him less of a glass cannon and more of just a cannon mm -hmm. uh, than it used to be. Um, in terms of defensive stuff, uh, he has a built-in unmade trigger on his defense, and uh, it's a unmade is a defense willpower trigger that after resolving, the attacker suffers one irreducible damage. Uh, and since it's after resolving, it doesn't matter if, it six, if the attack succeeds or fails. If you get yeah. the tome on uh, defensive willpower, your opponent is taking one irreducible damage. So it's a great way to punish your opponent. Um, and this synergizes with the uh, last ability that, that Leviticus had, uh, Ruinous Repair, which is probably the, the newest and strangest ability on his card. Um, it's an Aura 8, where when an enemy model takes damage from either the Entropy ability which, or the Unmade ability, which uh, a lot of the models in the crew have, a friendly model within three inches of that model uh, heals one. So you can have a case where your opponent will come in, attack you, miss, take one damage from made, and then you heal one. Nice. So you're not only uh, doing damage to your opponent, you're healing yourself. So it's sort of a deterrent slash uh, 
way to keep your crew alive uh, throughout the course of the game. Uh, so it's and that ability can trigger once per activation, so it can work on your activations uh, or your opponent's activations uh, all throughout the turn. So it's a potential significant amount of healing uh, coupled with a reasonable amount of damage that you get from the unmade and entropy abilities. Yeah, I mean the ability to be able, the ability to swing, you know, to to deal damage and heal damage at the, and heal your own damage at the same time is a really nice swing. Josh, the other thing I just noticed too, looking at the card, is um, it's interesting. His melee attacks defense, but his range attack on making attacks willpower. I would imagine that gives you some flexibility in deciding based on whatever your target priority is, kind of which way to go. It does the uh, the fact you can channel to get. Very high accuracy on both of those uh, sort of it just tends to what cards you have in hand and how much damage you're willing to take on yourself uh, to get an attack through if you're not willing to take a whole bunch of damage you know the two damage for channel plus two damage for the the trigger the ne- necrotic decay trigger um, you may want to err more on the side of range attacks mm-hmm. uh, so that you are only taking a little bit of damage uh, throughout the course of it and potentially uh, getting some soul stones back through the triggers that you can get on, on making. So Owen, can we talk a little bit about more about Pariah's soul, his demise ability? Can we just like mechanically exactly how that works? Absolutely. So mechanically what uh, Leviticus brings to the table, two totems, these totems thematically are uh, sort of, they're called hollow waifs and they are basically undead, people who have been turned into mindless automatons for Leviticus. And so he has bound his essence into them. And so what happens is anytime he would be killed as a demise trigger, instead you place him in base contact with one of your waves, heal him to eight. Uh, He's base 10. He goes to eight and then kill the wave. So this basically gives him two extra lives throughout the course of the game. And unlike in second edition, the waif can be anywhere. There's gone is the concept of an anchor. It's just wherever the waif is, is wherever he shows up. Yeah. And then that adds a whole nother level of play, uh, which we'll kind of dig into. Um, Oh, and the last thing I want to do before we kind of wrap this up is let's talk a little bit about his tactical actions because they're very interesting. Yeah. So there's two two tactical actions that he has. The first one bonus action called sanguine evocations. This uh, for magic players out there is scry three. But for non magic folks, it is look at the top three cards of your deck. Um, So this allows you to see what's coming. You can reorder those cards and then you can choose to suffer damage to discard any number of those cards at uh, one damage per card. So you need to remember to do this at the start of your activation. I I can't tell you how important that is and how many times I've forgotten to do that and regretted it. Uh, But knowing ahead of time whether you're going to need to cheat, whether you can get by on a negative flip and still flip high, it's, it's critical to the success of his attacks. It's very similar, Owen, and Josh, you'll know this. It's very similar to, to Whisper, which is an upgrade we have in Rezzers, Um, But you have a lot more flexibility because you can actually get rid of cards. Yeah, uh, I would say this is the upgraded form of intuition on several different levels. The getting rid of cards is, is really awesome. Um, but though Owen said you, you always want to do it at the start of your turn. I don't know if that's always the case. If you have a good hand and you think you can get away with just by cheating, you can uh, just flip regularly, flip with focus, or flip with uh, channel, uh, and rely on the cards in your hand to make sure that the attack hits. And when you have less tools at your disposal, you can then use Sanguine Evocation to stack the deck so you don't have to rely on stuff coming out of your hand. So it's more flexible than intuition, which is mandatory at the start start of your turn. So in theory, what I could be doing too is if I, you know, had a good hand, um, maybe didn't have as critical, or I knew I had what I needed to make what I needed to happen happen, I could do it at the end of Levy's activation and potentially setting up a, some de- defensive tech um, for what's about to come at me now that I've ended my master activation. Yeah, that's a really yeah. great point, and that's absolutely something you can do depending on the tactical situation at hand. Um, yeah. 
How about Essence Transfer? So Essence Transfer is a really interesting ability, and it ties into the life is a resource concept. So 12 inches, he needs to get a four or better, uh, and it's pick two models. Notably, he can pick himself, and one of those two models is going to heal up to four, uh, and the other model is going to suffer that much damage. So basically, uh, what he can do is transfer damage from one model to another. So he can take things from his A-bombs. He can take life from something that has a lot of life, give it to something that's almost dead. Suddenly your Ashes and Dust is stronger. Suddenly Marlena is stronger. Or he can use it even to heal himself or to move his own wounds somewhere else. So in actual gameplay, Owen, where do you see, I mean, there's several ways it can be utilized, but really what's the primary way you you're leveraging that ability or are you not leveraging it? I mean, out of five turns, how many times are you using it? So I'm going to maybe use it every now and then. I definitely don't personally use that ability every game, but there are situations where that range 12 can be the difference between keeping your beater alive uh, and your beater dying. So it definitely has its place, um, but it's not an every time type of thing. How about you, Josh? Is this something that you that you often use, or uh, is it one of those abilities that you you don't use enough, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, I forget he does that. It it borders on the second more often than not, only yeah. because it's competing with Sanguine Evocation, which is just so good for exactly what uh, Leviticus is trying to do. But there are, are several models in the Leviticus crew that you really want to keep alive, or want to keep at a high wound total in particular like ashes and dust uh so having something that you can just drop for a easy uh significant heal uh can be really advantageous in those situations but it is very situational right uh, yeah if, if you're going to forget any ability on on his card it'll probably be that one yeah and it, it uses a master ap which is um no small resource um to leverage uh but i can imagine it can be one of those oh shit i didn't know he could do that abilities yeah, exactly. It's occasionally, it's going to be the clutch play, and it's going to either win you the game or really make the difference, but the rest of the time, you're going to focus on killing things. So the one other thing which we, I think, missed back on the, the attack section is a really important aspect of his melee attack, and that is that there is a trigger on it for him to summon an abomination. So he, oh, wow. So he has potential... Uh, incidental summoning when he kills a model. So if he hits this trigger on his melee, it's if you kill the target, summon an abomination in base with it, which is adding insult to injury when you take away an enemy piece and add one of your own. Yeah, that's that swing is always nasty. If you've ever played against Albus, it's just a nasty swing. Um, do you find yourself stoning for that, or is it, if it happens, it happens? Um, I generally like to run fairly light on stones so i don't typically stone for it um but you know I, it has happened but I, usually it's a if it happens it happens or if i right. i might cheat a card if i had it got it got it so guys i think that gives us kind of a good feel and you know you, you can talk about levy in isolation but i think what really makes Levy good is not only is his card strong. I mean, you just read the front and the back and you realize how good he is, um, but it's the crew that makes the big difference. So we're going to take a quick break. When we get back from this break, I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, Amalgam crew itself. And I want to get a feel from these guys. What are the auto hires? What are their tech pieces? Um, uh, who's running schemes? And uh, really kind of understand the, the larger ecosystem around them. So we'll be right back. the friendship is sharing deal because i want one of your mcnuggets and i need some of your quarter pounder there's a deal for everyone at mcdonald's get one favorite like 10 piece chicken mcnuggets a quarter pounder or a big mac and get another for just a buck price and participation may vary valid for item of equal or lesser value howdy friends craig here nothing makes malifaux easier than having the right tools here at the third floor we love all the licensed malifaux goodies from custom meeple not only are they helping support this podcast they sell custom made weird licensed tokens and terrain they sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3x3 full Malifaux board. 
Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com, that's with one M, or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend, all one word, T H I R D F L O O R F R I E N D, you'll get a 5% discount and help support the podcast. It's valid on everything except retail products and playmats. Um, I can tell you, um, if you, uh, you can read Levy all day long, you can listen to this podcast twice, uh, cause nobody listens to us just once and you're still not going to understand, um, what he's doing. Um, and, uh, it's one of these masters that I think is a player to run him and to play against him. You've got him to face him at least once. And I, and I'll warn you for those of you out there, um, He's he's going to give you bad feels the first time you run against him because you're just not going to you you can't prepare enough. But by the second or third time you play him, you you, you start to understand what he's doing. Um, but uh, a big part of that too is understanding this crew. So Josh, you you know obviously we talked about the hollow waves, we've talked about Levy. Um, I'd be curious to know that once you've made the decision to run Leviticus, what is really the first or maybe you know first one or two models that you always bring in? It doesn't matter what the pool is. It doesn't matter what the opponent is these are models that are going to be in every crew so for that there's an obvious choice and I, what i think is a slightly less obvious choice the obvious choice is rusty alice rusty alice uh still leviticus's henchman from way back in first edition uh is probably in her strongest most useful state that i've ever seen her in the game oh uh, yeah <laughs> she is a amazing range damage piece uh Highly mobile, pretty good defenses, uh, and has a min three gun at twelve inches that ignores hard to wound and has the execute trigger. God. I mean, that plus rapid fire, so you can potentially get three or four, depending on uh, what models you have in the crew and what buffs you put on her. Uh, attacks with that in a single round. Yeah, I, I can tell you right now, Josh, that um, when I hear people, uh, you know, making noise about levy. If I don't hear Rusty mentioned in the first four sentences, I completely discount the opinion and I I don't even want to talk to you about Levy because she is so good. So good. Uh, But not too good to nerf. Leave our girl alone. (laughs) She is appropriately good for her cost. So for for everybody listening, listening in a suburb in Atlanta, we just decided she doesn't need a nerf. Definitely not. You're wrong, Kyle. (laughs) Her move six is fine. It's fine. (laughs) It's fine. Um, But average defense, good willpower, uh, has the unmade trigger and the entropy ability, which is the common abilities uh, that you see on a lot of the amalgam models. Yeah. Um, She also has armor one, which is, I, the call back to the uh, bulletproof that she had in second edition and yep. rapid fire to discard a card for an extra shot. Her melee attack is pretty good. Stat, stat five, uh, two, three, five damage, but I can, can pass out some injured, but her gun is where the money lives. Uh, range 12, stat six, three, four, five damage spread ignores hard to wound. Like I said before, execute trigger. It's just a, just an amazing attack. Well, uh, an execute trigger on a henchman. Yes. The execute is not as strong as it used to be, but in a pinch, uh, you can use it to either just straight kill models or drain resources from your opponent. It's very solid. Yeah, the the execute trigger is, I think, is a, to your point, Josh, is a little bit more of a finesse trigger mm-hmm. now. Um, that in the right hands, it's devastating. So if you're going up against somebody who knows how to time and to have the resources to act to execute the execute. It, it, it can be a huge game swing, but um, for other people that are playing it and if it happens, it happens, it's not nearly as devastating. But I, I've, I have faced precision players who, who knew when to make this happen. And I mean, have, has caused, you know, two or three models to come off the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I've, I've done that more with Jack Daw than with, uh, than Rusty, but absolutely. Yeah. Um, her tacticals are okay. Uh, 
So you can create pit traps that are similar, that are identical to the ones that uh, Mod Tucket puts out. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference between Mod Tucket and this is that uh, the Amalgam crew primarily can't ignore the pit traps and lacks the force movement to just casually throw people in and out of them. So they're less useful for the Amalgam crew. Uh, Rusty also has Etheric Healing, um, a cast that you, you get to discard a card and heal one, two, three based on the value of the discarded card. Situational, but, but nice to keep her alive because she doesn't have uh, any other healing baked into her. Yeah, her tacticals come off as kind of a, you know, all right, yeah, I guess I'll do a bonus action. Um, the healing obviously can be critical at certain times. Um, to just we made a joke about it, but um, her move six is something that is that is a, a, something you have to pay attention to because with the range of her gun, the deadliness of her gun, and then the ability to get where she needs to get with that move six, it, it is absolutely brutal and um. I don't know. Like I said, I faced it two or three times now, and I swear to God, I, every time, as soon as they discard the card for rapid fire, I'm like, "Son of a biscuit!" I forgot that she had that. Every time, it yeah. um, she's a good piece. She's a good piece, and I think she's worth ten out of keyword um, in some uh, some situations. Mm -hmm. Um, my slightly more controversial pick, or at least less obvious pick, is Marlena Webster, and she's sort of the glue that holds my Leviticus crew together. Uh. Marlena Webster was one of the models that came from that uh, contest that we did a while back to have these story encounter generated uh, new models for the different factions. That yeah, that was so cool. I was so angry that Rezzers lost. <laughs> so <laughs> angry. So bitter. Um, but uh, Marlena herself um, is an enforcer. Eight wounds. Respectable defenses. Uh, defense six, willpower five. Respectable move. Um, armor one, uh, and to reduce damage, and also the withering away ability, which miles within three inches can't heal, which goes to the attrition aspect of the crew, where yep. a lot of your stuff can heal and you're preventing your opponent from doing the same, so you're really winning those exchanges. Um, but the thing that I bring her for is her soul tether ability, which is when another friendly non-minion within six inches suffers damage, it may reduce that damage by one to a minimum of zero. And if it does so, Marlena takes one damage. It's basically getting back to that theme of uh, using your wounds as a resource. This lets her take damage from Leviticus, take damage from Rusty Alice onto herself so that it can keep your more choice targets alive. It can actually, since this will affect irreducible damage, one of the few things that can reduce irreducible damage, uh, it lets you reduce the damage that Leviticus takes from channeling. Oh, right, right. So that he only takes one from channeling, so he's not chewing through his wounds anywhere near as fast. Um, yeah, she's good. She's not cheap, and nor should she be, because she's she's strong. Um, but uh, I, I could, I you know, I never even thought about being able to use that with channel. That's I don't think anybody's done that against me. That's nasty. But she, I would imagine there's a little bit of skill and finesse involved there, Josh, because I mean, you need her positioning is key with her, right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a respectable size aura, and she's on a forty uh, height three on a forty, so she gets the line of sight pretty easily. Um, but yeah, six inch bubble. So a, a 12 inch span across the board. Yeah. Um, notably she's only an enforcer, not a henchman. So she has a pretty big target on her head, which we'll probably get to talk about later. Um, her attacks are decent, but her last, uh, really good ability is etheric healing. It's the same one that Rusty Alice has. Um, the big difference between what Rusty has and this one is that Merlina has built in surge. Oh, nice. And the discard to heal is, optional so if you want and she doesn't need the healing or you don't have a card to discard you can cast a theory healing to just get a free card well that's interesting i don't think i've ever thought about that right I do it every right. time every yeah time. it's it's it, you, uh, stat sick oh you need a six to get a free card nice what, yeah and, and her attacks are decent uh entropic withering ignores hard to kill and hard to wound uh so good for taking out those pesky Rezzer models. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm bitter about that, but yeah, so she adds a like a layer of resilience to the crew, where people yeah. are expecting to that Leviticus gets weakened by uh, damaging himself, and that they'll be able to put a bunch of damage into him, but 
you combine uh, Soul Tether plus uh, Ruinous Repair plus use Soul Stones, and I've had cases where Leviticus came out with more wounds than he started after an attack. I could see that. I could definitely see that. Owen, oh, are these the first two models you hire? So I think I would put Ashes and Dust one step above Marlena, but for me, really, it's it's all three of them. They're right. the core. Like Marlena, as Josh said, is kind of the, she's not the linchpin exactly in the sense that the crew can still function without her, but her ability to tank wounds off of your other models goes a really long way to keeping people alive. Um, yeah. Especially when you think about Ashes and Dust, who is incorporeal, he's already reducing damage by one to a minimum of zero. So if he takes a min two attack, one of those damage can go to Marlena and the other one can be reduced to zero. So he can take no damage, which is yep. pretty awesome. So now thinking about this, cause well, and I want to, uh, if we can go into Owen in just a second, go in deeper into ashes and dust, but um, this is an expensive core crew. Yep. It's uh, I believe 24 soul stones for the. Yeah. So, um, for those that have never faced Ashes and Dust, let's kind of give them a look and feel. He's similar to two, but not exactly. Yeah, so Ashes and Dust in two was frequently called a second master and like wildly broken and overpowered. And that was because he had three AP and basically could always respawn. In second edition, he is now only two AP, uh, which makes him slightly more normal and in line yep uh they buffed his movement to seven uh to help compensate for that which is pretty awesome uh and so he is a a really great damage dealing beater piece who still has the ability to come back from the dead um and it's a pretty unique way that this happens so the the flavor is he is a dust storm swirling around an ancient evil idol. Uh, and so what happens is when he is quote unquote killed, the dust storm sort of disassociates to the idol. And so that, um, that drops the ashen core drops in base with ashes and dust. Then a new dust storm spawns on any board edge, more than six inches from the opponent's deployment zone. If these two models can get back together, uh, the core is stationary, but if the dust storm can get to base with the core and do a bonus action, it can then respawn back into a full ashes and dust at the end of the turn. So that means if you are careful about where ashes and dust is and you keep him within range of a dust double move, you can keep coming back to life every turn. Yeah, and the uh, the thing that's critical to call out here um, is, you know, we think about Leviticus first and foremost, and I, when I say Leviticus, I really mean the uh, Amalgam crew as damage dealing, but think about the moves and the mobility we've talked about so far with the uh, the ability for Levy to get around, especially if, you know, his demise ability is enacted, for the ability to Rusty to get around with move six, and now Ashen's dust at move seven. Um, th- th- this crew is shockingly fast. Absolutely. And that's, I think, the key element of this. So, Outcasts have Victorias, who are also fairly fast and yep. and damaging, uh, and then Leviticus. And I think what sets the two of them apart is, in a lot of ways, the, the Amalgam crew has more abilities to jump across the board in one fell swoop, yeah, and a little bit more resilience and staying power, uh, whereas the Victorias have a little bit more raw damage output uh, all in one burst. So that's kind of your trade-off decision between the two. Yeah, and depending on the pool, Josh, I would imagine that's where you decide whether you go Vix or whether you go Levy, right? Yeah, how much you expect to get back in return. Like, yeah. Vix are better at dishing it out, uh, but Leviticus and the Malgram are much better at taking it. They have the healing, they have... Uh, the regeneration, they have the uh, no action summons, so that they're, they're I, I think, from as the attrition crew. 
Right. You don't need to clear out your opponent. You can you can uh, gradually wear them down while maintaining a comparable degree of strength in your crew. So out of curiosity, Josh, um, you know, we got we definitely got a sense of who's um, doing damage here. I'd be curious to know who's dropping scheme markers, who's flipping turf markers. If you need to get across the board to uh, drop scheme markers, uh, they have Necropunks, which are a high quality scheme runner, five soul stones yeah. for suited leap and uh, armor one and hard to wound. They're easy targets with defense four, willpower four, but they are just an exceedingly fast model. It's possible if you really need it, you can speed them up a little bit with depending on your crew selection. Um, I also take prospectors, which are a their own little bit of scheme marker tech, mostly for the the soul stones. But that's the, those are the two that I am I'm typically running for scheme markers. Also, ashes and dust is just a really good at uh, running up a flank, clearing out anyone who's there, and then just spending the rest of his turn dropping scheme markers. I've had that happen on several occasions where he'll just uh, steamroll the the people that are on a single. Uh, edge of the board and then spend the rest of the game uh scoring me victory points and that's i think that's a kind of a good mentality to have in general josh because very often we can lock people into their roles and it, it does it matter if ashes and dust uh deleted models i mean that's his job is to delete models but what if he didn't delete any models and he scored you three points i guess you're okay with that right as long as you're thinking that uh it was worth those costs. You wouldn't have uh, points better spent elsewhere. And with Ashes and Dust, I honestly don't think you're going to find it. Regardless of what he's doing, he's probably going to do it pretty well. Yeah, and, and a good shout out on the Prospectors. And um, uh, Prospectors are a, a versatile model, um, and uh, we're not going to go over them, but uh, definitely look at their cards. Um, and you can see where um, I think there's good arguments on how uh, outcasts have a really strong pool of versatile models to work from and prospectors are part of that. Um, oh, and do you find yourself ever hiring out of keyword or is there any other versatile models you bring in? So I'm, I'm actually a really huge fan of the emissary. Uh, I know that may or may not be a popular opinion, um, but I really like the emissary with Leviticus, especially uh, for two reasons. One, the plus one movement aura uh, helps everyone be faster. Everyone loves a walk eight ashes and dust. Um, then the healing aura. So the emissary is bringing not only an aura where anyone who activates within three heals one, he also has a tactical action to heal a model and give them trinket upgrades. So I will frequently give Marlena a regen one uh, trinket and then nice. have her within three of the emissary. So she is tanking everyone's wounds and then healing back extremely quickly. Uh, and then on the scheming front, there's nothing more fun than giving a pretty floral bonnet to ashes and dust so that you can <laughs> run uh, 16 inches up the board going through terrain because he's incorporeal and then scoring a bunch of your backfield schemes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, now, Josh, I was wondering, you know, this is, seems like a crew that uh, is top heavy a little bit, right? So, I mean, even if we're talking about the emissary on top of that, you know, things are getting real expensive. Do you ever find room um, or a need to hire another master into a, a levy crew? I don't think he needs it. There's there's some that will accentuate it a little bit, but I don't think it is strictly speaking necessary. His high end models all get the job done really well. Um, but you could bring in someone like Parker. Parker has the perk of uh, freeing you up from needing to take interact actions. So right. instead of taking interact actions, you can just do that Leviticus and the Malcolm Crew thing of just slaughtering your opponents. You can spend your AP just doing murder. Leverage Parker to to get interact actions at uh, select times. Yeah, and I would imagine too, Josh or Owen, that um, he would not necessarily be a great master to hire because he really needs his waifs, which ups his cost. Um, and it might be hard to imagine him without something like Marlena to help. Um, I mean, I don't know if I would, I know I've never seen it, but I don't know if you'd ever want to hire Levy. Would you? No, I, I don't think I'd ever do it. Yeah. 
not for twenty soul stones to yeah. to get everything and yep. not even all of his extra regen tech because uh the ruinous repair uh triggers off of everyone's uh unmade or everyone's entropy. So the less unmade, less entropy you have around, the less likely it is to trigger. Yep. Yep. Um, oh, and how about uh, outcast upgrades? Um, are you bringing any of those into your crews? So I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of mixed on outcast upgrades just overall. And I think I talked about this in the Terra pod. I think our upgrades are okay, but not great. Like we're not Arcanists. Um, <laughs> so or yeah, or resers, right? So, no, I got that, Josh. Be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, the main one I'm potentially looking at is Servant of the Dark Powers. So what this upgrade does is it's the model with this upgrade gets a free six-inch move at the start of the game. Then they gain uh, an ability that every time they kill a model, they heal two, which is handy for models that have to spend health to kill things. Uh, and then for minions, it gives them either terrifying uh, t- 11 uh, or plus one to terrifying. So it's potentially useful on Leviticus so that he can heal from killing things at range or potentially useful on a desolation engine so it can try to stay alive and be terrifying 13. Um, but Josh, I think you... Uh, you like some other upgrades potentially? So being a huge fan of Marlena, uh, the only thing that would really augment her more would be to put possibly soldier for hire on her. If your opponent knows that she's kind of a, a key piece in the keeping the crew alive as well as it does. Uh, and also the fact that since she's not a uh, henchman, uh, she's squishier than a lot of the other heavies in the crew. Uh, she, is kind of has a pretty big target. So if you can put soldier fryer on her for just a little bit more resilience, but even then that's not a, that's not an auto take by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. So out of curiosity, Josh, I mean, there, there's kind of a, uh, a very tempting gimmick in a levy crew and that's the uh, abominations and, you know, turning them into a desolation engine. Do you find yourself hiring to pull that off or if, is if it, if it happens in a turn, it happens, or are you hiring a desolation engine? How, like, how does that uh, kind of obvious gimmick when you first look at the crew uh, actually end up becoming uh, used if at all? No. <laughs> it's just, just no. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he needs gimmicks. Is really what it yeah. comes down to. Uh, and if you're putting a lot of moving pieces into pulling off the acquisition of a desolation engine, which are an awesome model if you can get them right in your opponent's face, but otherwise, defense three. Yeah, like there, there's enough ruthless out there. There's enough people who will just cheat in to pass the terrifying to take out your defense three model before it has a chance to do the nasty things it can do when you get when it gets up in your face and that's a nasty hire for 10 points yeah that's a lot of points there's a lot of points that's one more than ashes and dust that's an emissary yep. that's take that's barbaros uh that's pride plus an upgrade yeah. yep uh and abominations are just not resilient enough like if you if you hire a bunch of those, someone could just come in, and snipe your one A bomb, and now you have two crummy models in your backfield, not really accomplishing much. Right, and then and then you might end up be making some bad decisions trying to force the issue with you know getting that trigger off a levy, right? Yeah, you don't you don't need the gimmicks to succeed. If you yep. somehow manage to kill three of your enemies' models, get the triggers three times. Honestly, at that point, the Desolation Engine is almost just icing on the cake. Yeah, it's a win more. You've yeah. already crushed them pretty hard. A little bit more crushing is not going to be the, the deciding factor in that game, I'm guessing. Now, I, I, I will put in one uh, little plug for the Abomination. Not as a hire, um, but if you can summon them, they are nasty little tar pits. Uh, and for one... Well, two two big reasons. One, they have the amalgam wide ability of entropy, which is mm-hmm. if a model activates within three, you just suffer a damage. So 
pretty much every model in this uh, in this crew has that ability. So you're plinking uh, some incidental damage all over the place. So that's good. It also has the withering away. Enemy models within three cannot heal. That is super annoying to have in the middle of your crew. So if you can summon one into a mass of enemy models, especially folks that depend on healing, like say right. McMorning. McMorning. Yeah, yep. like uh, goodbye all of your defense. It's also yep. notable that Marlena Webster also has uh, that withering away, and she blocks enemy healing within three. Yeah, that, that that can be brutal and builds off that attrition theme that we've talked about. So, guys, let's take another break real quick. When we get back from the break, I want to talk about um, there's a lot of competition in Outcast. Um, I think one of the things that makes them um, a great faction, um, it's a faction that I often will find myself recommending to new players, is uh, they've got a, a really strong stable. Um, I, I They've got a lot of really good choices. And what I like about it is they've got um, – They've got the tools to fit the pool. So I want to learn from these guys, when does Levy become the top of the list and really what I consider some decent competition. So we're going to find out what strategies and schemes uh, they like Levy into. And uh, for those of you that play against Levy, they're going to give us a couple of schemes to avoid picking when you play them. So we'll be right back. Howdy friends, here on the third floor, you'll find us playing Malifaux and other games on Mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, and lighter than neoprene. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. Pick a mat size, pick a design, then choose an overlay like the one for Marvel Crisis Protocol or Malifaux 3rd Edition. It will speed up deployment and the placement of strategy and objective markers. If you're going to Adepticon this year, be sure to check out the Mats by Mars booth. Until the end of March 2020, you can use the new promo code THIRDFLOOR320, that's THIRDFLOOR320, to get a 10% discount on your next order. In the notes, you can ask for the Third Floor logo to be put on your mat for free. Again, use the promo code THIRDFLOOR320 to get a 10% discount. Details are in the show notes. So, like I mentioned, you know, the, the competition is there um, within Outcast. So, Owen, uh, I'd be curious to know, is, is there a particular strategy that, that really uh, turns Levy into the cream that rises to the top? Yeah, so I think the, the obvious go-to is Reckoning. Uh, so that, for two reasons. One, Levy deals a lot of damage. And two, he's hard to kill. Uh, yep. He himself is hard to bring down. The other models in his crew hard to bring down uh, with ashes and dust having a replace doesn't actually count as killed. So he, they have a lot of ways to avoid giving up points and a lot of ways to take those points. So for me, that's the most obvious go-to. Um, but Josh, what's your, what's your number two? Uh, that would be turf war because turf war starts as being a chilly strat. So you can flip the, the opponent's markers back to neutral. So, that's playing to his strength right there. Uh, second, you have the good mobility on the Killy models that Leviticus has, uh, with Ashes and Dust being extremely fast and also extremely Killy, so he can both get to the markers and flip them, or uh, get to the different quadrants of the board and kill stuff there. So he, he can he can fill both of those things. And uh, in, in fitting with that, um, I, I wanted to point out one model that we had hadn't talked about before the scavengers the new uh minion for leviticus uh that i think replaced a bombs in his eventual new box i'm guessing um are a a top tier support piece that really helps with uh accomplishing the the mobility and killing game um they have their their big shtick is the ability weird device which i believe takes a seven to get off and has a its default effect is to give the model focus, um, but it has a trigger on each one of the suits, and it can have some control over which suit it's getting because it also has tools for the job. 
So one of the suits on there, I believe it's the crow one, is the burnout trigger, which gives the model take two damage and gain fast. So you put that on ashes and dust, and he can now run. A, he can now run twenty five inches, or oh. uh, twenty one inches plus one inch melee. Or if you have the emissary, it's twenty four inches plus one inch melee for twenty five inch reach on an attack. And he has a focus at that point. Or on Rusty Alice, who only takes one damage from that, um, so she's able to get to different positions in the board, flip markers, and still make an attack. Still make two attacks yeah. because she has rapid fire. So Rusty moving seven inches. Uh, flipping a marker and making two attacks is really great for Turf War. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the keys, and you've kind of hinted at it, Josh, one of the keys about Turf War is you want to bring a crew that's going to dictate where the action's going to happen because of the ability for deaths to cause markers to flip to neutral. And it really feels like this Amalgam crew has that ability with the mobility and the, the death-dealing threat I would imagine that you're kind of dictating, you know, where stuff's going to go down. You can kill them up close. You can kill them far away. Uh, yep. You have a lot of ability to get to where exactly you want to go and, and get the job done. So, Owen, is there uh, one or two schemes that you just love to see when you've got Levy as your uh, master? Uh, before we jump into the schemes, I want to put in one sort of maybe sleeper strat pick. <laughs> okay. As well. So, uh, I don't think Levy is the first choice for plant explosives. Uh, for me personally, that's going to be Terra. But Terra has some really bad matchups, notably yep. Guild. I'm never going to play Terra into Guild. They have too many ways to negate her whole... Well, they've got game. one model that'll ruin your day. Exactly. So, in situations where the pool is plant explosives, but my opponent is Guild, uh, I may often turn to Levy because he also has the speed to send yep. models across the board to drop those markers. Well, and the resiliency to not only be, to speed across there, drop those markers, but then to be able to protect them. Exactly. Yep. Yep. No, that's a good call out. So how about schemes? Uh, Owen, what are one or two schemes that um, Le- Levy and his crew tend to excel in? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of assassinate. Uh, again, yep. he kills stuff dead, uh, but also it's hard to kill him. So it's, it's the good combo of, this is a scheme that's good for you and it's bad for your opponent. Um, now, granted, you have to be careful if it's in the pool because your opponent could score that first point if you're not careful with how you manage Leviticus's life. Oh, they're, right. They're very difficult to score that second point. Yeah. Um, number two, sometimes, uh, if it's there, I love taking Vendetta. Uh, however, being a fairly top-heavy crew, this is mostly going to work against other elite crews. Or yeah. in things like Reckoning, where people want to take more elite crews for resiliency, that's when you might have an opportunity for a model like, say, Merlina to take uh, to take that vendetta against, uh, say, your enemy's beater. Josh, I'd be curious to know for you, is there any scheme that um, wasn't real obvious at first, but you kind of took it uh, because you had a, maybe a, a rough pool? Is there is there kind of a sleeper scheme out there that uh, Levy actually does well in? So, oddly enough, deliver the message uh, Oh, okay. for Leviticus, because people don't really want to get close to him. Right. Like, he he has the chance of just clearing you off the board if you are within his within striking distance of him. Um, meanwhile, you have like ashes and dust, which, as we mentioned, uh, can just be startlingly fast and walk through everything because he's incorporeal uh, to go up and deliver a message uh, very aggressively because of his his resilience. Uh, so it's again getting back to the. Uh, hard for your, harder for your opponent to do, uh, easy for you to do type of scheme. Uh, and you can combine it with some scheme marker tech, like by way of the, uh, the emissary, really playing him up. I'm 100% uh, in the emissary camp for Leviticus um, yep. to try to get the, the end of the game uh, score on that. What is a scheme, Josh, that nobody should be picking uh, if, if they're facing Levy? So what, is, what, is, what does he counter hard? Uh, we talked about assassinate. Well, I would not do uh, 
claim jump against Leviticus because he, it's easy enough for him to take out basically anyone. Like some of the yeah. more expensive models out there, the ones that have like serene countenance uh, th- that are just generically difficult to, to target. Uh, he can get through that even if they're standing in cover. He can focus and channel and get through just a wide range of defensive features that way. And you've got the mobility that if you smell it, you can make sure that you've got somebody in that circle. Yeah. You can always yeah. run, probably not ashes and dust because that's too far away from a board edge for him to feel safe. Right. But you can get someone up in there or just clear them out. Yeah. Did, did we mention that Rusty Alice has moved six for some reason? I don't know if we brought that up yet or not. <laughs> no, fine. That's new. fine. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Um, oh, and how about you? Is there um, is there any particular schemes that uh, that you love or that you would uh, not uh, recommend as a pick against Levy? Um, I don't know. I would say power ritual. Weirdly, um, so so power ritual for two reasons. One, if it's in the pool, I'm probably going to take a prospector. Because that prospector right. is going to be pretty easily protect your, you know, at least one of your backfield corners. Uh, and then the other reason is, and this kind of gets into the the second level play, but ashes and dust. Usually, when he splits apart, you're focused on trying to put him back together again. But yep. you don't have to. You could put that dust storm anywhere on any corner. Mm-hmm which means that corner where you dropped a scheme marker two turns ago and no one at all is near it, guess what? Dust is there and he's going to go pick it up. So yep. you can pretty easily deny uh, power ritual and get into position to mess with that. I think that's a nice lead in Owen to kind of our next segment. So we're going to take a break. And when we get back from this break, I want to talk about two things. One, I want to talk about second level play. And then as somebody who's lost to Levy three times, I would really love to hear what these guys think about um, what, what scares them. So when they have Levy on the table, what is there some, is there something that the opponent can bring or something that the opponent can do that uh, potentially could help um, mitigate um, really what I think is one of the better masters and better keywords in the game. So we'll be right back. My name is Jacob Suderman, and my dad is a patron of the Third Floor Wars. I like the Third Floor Wars because the deep dives tell me a lot about a master, and when I get my second master, I'm going to use the deep dives to tell which one I want. Hey, you should be a patron too. So how much are three or four of these episodes worth to you a month? Third Floor Wars has a Patreon, and if you think they're worth a dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars a month, swing by and become a patron. We have polls to decide the next episode of the pod, along with early releases of articles and podcasts. Everything we release goes out to everyone, but sometimes our patrons get a head start. The link is in the show notes, or just search for Third Floor Wars on Patreon.com. Thanks for the support. Need to give a quick shout out to one of our new patrons, Constatin, and a bigger shout out to uh, the people that have contributed the most to our Patreon so far since we started it. Uh, Nick Westbrook, Stephen Morris, Kevin Smith, Sam Newman, Craig Chuba, Jeremy Peace, James Hahn, Brandon Somer, and Ambrose Ingram. We can't thank you guys enough. Uh, you are our top patrons. So uh, w- when you play a crew uh, the first time, the second time, you know, you're learning the mechanics, you're figuring out what the key, you know, the signature abilities are, what the keyword abilities are. Um, but sometimes you kind of stumble across a uh, either a hidden strength or hidden weakness or a combo that you never really noticed. Um, something that I think that can bring the level of play up to what I call second level play. So, Josh, what is something that people uh, it, it won't notice at first, but uh, maybe after listening to this podcast or getting the reps in themselves, uh, uh, maybe some neat tricks or things to keep in mind uh, that will help uh, kind of up their game? So one of the recurring themes that we've mentioned throughout this is using wounds as a resource and tied into that is sort of careful wound management on some of your guys. Yeah. In particular, uh, ashes and dust. His big shtick is when he dies, he breaks apart and then can reform at the uh, end of the round. So you want to be able to take full advantage of that capability. Uh, a smart opponent 
won't kill a weakened ashes and dust that's already activated because right. then you get a activation of the dust storm and then you just reform as a full wound uh, ashes and dust the next turn they'll leave a weakened ashes and dust out there to kill early on in in the next round to deprive you of the ability to have a full activation out of ashes and dust so in that case if they won't do the job you got to do the job for them and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you just have to kill your own guys. You, you do that yeah. a lot less in this edition than, you know, casually shooting Leviticus in the head back in first edition. But taking out a wounded ashes and dust on your own uh, so that you can have a full strength one the next turn can sometimes be a good play. Sure, sure. I don't think I would have thought of that. So that's nice. And and really the key is, is whether he's activated or not, right? Yes. You want to do it after he's activated. Uh, because if he hasn't activated, you'll get an activation out of the Ashen Core, but that's not always super useful. Um, a full activation out of Ashes and Dust tends to be much more uh, effective. Um, yep. The one thing to remember when trying to kill your own Ashes and Dust is if he's in melee, you can shoot into that melee. Oh no, you get a negative flip. Um, but he can just relent, so you'll hit him. Uh, right. Then you have to remember that he has Incorporeal. You don't want to think you have a, a week that will kill him and then realize that his own defensive features are biting you in the butt. Sure. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're going to try to kill your own ashes and dust. Make sure you have the damage to do it. And then the, the yeah. next next level play of that is use Leviticus's uh, ability to move wounds. Oh, right. And just kill him with irreducible damage. Heal yourself then, in the meantime. Heal yourself off of it. Oh god, that's frustrating. Quality use of sang- of uh man, I don't even remember that ability's name. Is, Is it that you? Sang- oh, that's how that's how often <laughs> these guys use it. <laughs> yeah. Essence transfer. Yeah. Uh so Owen, how about you? What are what are some things that you kind of figured out about uh this crew um after you got your reps in? So another cool thing you can do is uh so I already mentioned using the dust storm to surprise contest schemes. Yep. It can be awesome for take prisoner, for outflank, uh, for power ritual. Uh, the other thing you can do is strategically killing Leviticus himself so that he can then teleport somewhere else on the board. So the cool part about this is that this can actually happen mid activation. So oh. he has abilities such as essence transfer uh, that can kill himself. If he's close to low wounds, he can actually transfer his own life away. Similarly, the uh, sanguine evocation where you can discard any number of cards, then suffer that amount of damage. It's not a cost to discard the card. So it gets around the restriction on declaring actions that would kill yourself. So he can actually kill himself off of that. Pop up somewhere else with his life refilled and then continue his turn somewhere more useful, uh, continuing to do action. So it's it's not something you're going to do all the time because you're spending one of his own limited lives, but it can be a huge surprise to opponents when suddenly he moves in the middle of his turn. Yeah, and that can be a turn five move, right? Or it, it, what's key here is that it's something that, you know, you probably didn't think of at first, which means your opponent hasn't thought of it and really can be, that's the difference between a loss and a tie or a tie and a win, um, especially late late game. Absolutely. Very nice. So, Owen, um, I think we've made a strong case um, for how good this crew is. Um, what are some things that you faced, either uh, some tech pieces that you really hate or some uh, uh, strategies or tactics that you've seen that really make kind of a rough day for this crew? So I'm going to, I'm going to actually lead with none of those things and say, <laughs> okay, flank deployment. Interesting. Um, and it's, it doesn't ruin his day, but if you think about Ashes and Dust as viable operating theater, oh, it's right. based on the dust storm has to come in more than six inches from the enemy deployment zone. So on flank, you drastically reduce yeah. where he can safely be and respawn in the same turn. 
Uh, and since he's such a critical piece to the crew, I really dislike playing Leviticus into flank. Um, he's great for corner, though, because you have yep. the most operating theater for Ashes and Dust. Um, but more seriously, to your actual question, <laughs> uh, things that Leviticus doesn't like are things that turn off demise triggers. Because, right. Uh, Manos, uh, the Charm Warders, so pretty much Rezzers and Ten Thunders uh, can bring key tech pieces that make Leviticus have a pretty bad day. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Josh? What are, what are things that you've seen uh, people either do or bring that uh, has, has made life a little rough? Heart to Wound is surprisingly annoying against Leviticus. Huh. Uh, because he doesn't get around that anymore. And uh, even with Channel, unless you're beating them by or get a, a sufficient margin above them, you're still going to be on negative flips to damage. And he's still weak, too. Uh, so hard to wound is also often coupled with just a high wound count in general. I'm looking at you, Rezzers, again. Um, so if you're, if they're forcing you to do week two, sure, it's an irreducible week two damage, but it's still only still two. Still two. Yep. So, uh, with that low damage, uh, he's also, uh, they're also kind of vulnerable to shielded and, uh, healing. So yep. shielded can handle the the plink damage from the entropy aura, and healing can get around the general low damage spread for Leviticus himself for his ranged attack. So it's possible to just out heal him in that regard. Um, Marlena helps with that. Uh, Ash, uh, a bombs help with that. Um, but it's it's one of those things that those guys can't be everywhere. So uh, a little bit of healing can go a long way. A little bit of shielding can go a long way of of chewing up. The, the plink damage that he does around the board. Oh, and I'd be curious to know, um, how do you handle what I would consider um, the rather obvious target priority against him? So it, um, like I said, I have, I've yet to beat the guy. I've played him three times and uh, uh, with two different opponents and I've, I've yet to pull out a win, but that's not, not a big surprise because it's me. Um, but what, like, how do you handle the fact that the waifs have a big target on their head? Marlena has a big target on her head. Um, you know, how do you deal with that? So for the waifs, honestly, I keep them just hanging out behind terrain on the flanks. Like they're never coming out. Usually in most of my games, he doesn't actually ever die. Um, so right. it doesn't end up being a huge deal. If it looks like, he is going to die, then I may move them strategically up a flank, uh, but I keep them safe. Uh, as for Marlena, she definitely does go down. Um, the main, the main thing you can do is just keep her behind the crew. So if you have right. ashes and dust in front and Leviticus and rusty, you've got some big, scary pieces. Uh, they can be six inches ahead of her and still benefit from that aura while she is kind of out of reach of anything but snipers. Yeah, that gets to the placement elegance that you need to have with her a little bit too, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, something else you can do if you, and I know this is not all that frequent, but you could also tech in a piece like the Nothing Beast, who's another tall 50 millimeter base. So yeah. Between that and the ashes and dust, you can block a lot of sight lines, to Marlena. That makes sense. So, guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from this break, I'm going to take full advantage of the fact that I've got uh, two very seasoned players that have both played um, through several seasons of gaining grounds in uh, 2E and um, are now, you know, in 3, we've got gaining ground 0. And at some point in the next uh, 12 months, we're going to see gaining grounds 1. Um, I'm going to pick their brains a little bit about kind of where we are as far as the strategies and schemes. And uh, we'll do a little bit of speculation. So I'll be right back. Howdy folks, Craig here. Now, if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring, along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. 
The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to play a little game of kind of uh, Survivor's Island mixed with, um, I don't know, uh, being nostalgic and reminiscing. Um, So, Josh, uh, we've got four strategies. Um, I think... This is one of the stronger stables we've seen over the many gaining grounds. Uh, so don't misinterpret what I'm going to ask as me complaining about it, but I'm going to force you to pick one. What is your least favorite strategy that if it went away in season one, like I said, whether that happens next month or 12 months from now, I don't know, but um, what would you not miss if it disappeared? Even though both Reckoning and Turf War are both just straight up Killy strats and are I wouldn't say interchangeable, but similar enough <laughs> that one of them could disappear in the world one end. I'm going to have to say plant explosives. Just because okay. the crews that it it tends to are people just like spamming mooks to jump across the board. And I think that's just not as fun as having some big dramatic statement piece models. Sure, sure. Is there something you think you could would replace it with? So we've got that would leave you a turf war and reckoning, which you, to your point is, you know, is uh, a lot of killing with a little bit of positioning and uh, dictating the you know the the uh, place of the place of action. You've got cursed idols you've left alive. Is there something that we've seen in the past or, uh, or some, what's missing? I personally, and, and I'm certain there'll be a lot of disagreement with this. I missed the supply wagon. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> oh man! I thought that was so much fun. That's fantastic. You, th- that might be the most controversial thing ever said on this podcast. I, so, no joke. I was going to uh, say that as a joke, but you made me do it. I love it. it. So, Josh, I love the fact that you said that. So, very quickly, can you give everybody and I kind of not only uh, what the, what supply wagon was. Um, uh, and just it's just so you know, guys, when this was a much hated, hated strat that uh, was in gaining grounds, I don't remember. It was when I think it was one of the last ones in two. But if you can ex- yeah. So if you can explain to everybody really kind of the, the core mechanics of it and more importantly, why do you miss it? <laughs> <laughs> it so I, I mentioned planned explosives because I thought it uh, led to building silly crews of just a whole bunch of right. little guys who are running around doing stuff. Supply wagon is the exact opposite. The shtick for supply wagon is that you had a 50 millimeter marker that you had to move across the board. And you moved it by models going up and taking the interact action to push the wagon. And you pushed a distance based on your base size. So it was one, two, three inches for 30, 40, or 50 millimeters. So the whole, the, the crew building shtick in that one that really made things weird is that you wanted big based models to just throw this thing up the board as, as efficiently as possible. So rather than building your crew full of like of, of fast, speedy minions, you're now building out with your ridiculous 50 millimeter <laughs> model or attempt to the antithesis. N- uh, navigate the board that's now cluttered with terrain. It was just a it was a mess, but I enjoyed it so much. Yeah, it's funny. You get me thinking a little bit. I mean, I like the idea of at least one strategy you know, specifically built to impact crew building, right? Which to your point, Plant Explosives does. And so did um, uh, Supply Wagons, though. I think with Euripides existing, I don't know if we could bring Supply Wagons back. Mm-hmm, but um, uh, the, the the one drawback to uh, Supply Wagon is the way it played out, right? So the way it played out is you each had a, you each had a, a wagon and they typically would be, you know, at least 12 inches from each other, depending on where the center line was, diagonal or horizontal. And what would end up happening is turn one into bleeding into turn two is you would spend AP to get the thing pushed over to the opponent's side. And then you would all bum rush each other in the middle and just beat the shit out of each other and try to, you know, get the other wagon over. Um, but I think, you know, there there's opportunities there, Josh, to to take that idea and run with it, though, and maybe add a layer of strategy. Like one of the things that I've always thought um, would have been interesting and it could be terrible. I don't know. But what if there's only one supply wagon and you could make the restrictions around moving it uh, a little bit interesting? Um, yeah, I wouldn't want supply wagons purely back, Josh, but I, I, I think I'm smoking what you're growing. <laughs> Well, the, the other piece of that is you could kind of follow the pattern of this edition and do something like in order to score the next point, 
it has to be farther into the opponent's half than it was. That's before. interesting. So like yep. you have to keep pushing it. You can't just push it and stop. Um, oh, so maybe uh, to score, it has to be uh, at least twice as many inches as turn numbers or something along those yeah, lines. Exactly. I like that. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay. They, they okay. The general theme of, of how things are scored now. No, that that's good. Friend. They should make. It yeah. Happen. I like that. Owen. And I like to be, I like it because it also pairs up with some of the scheming themes of getting into each other's, territory to begin with anyway yeah um oh that's interesting that's interesting oh and how about you is is uh is the plant explosives the the one that would uh get voted off the island is there another strategy that you'd love it's, it's that another you one i, I okay. love plant explosives um but but actually getting to what we just talked about is the current edition heavily favors getting into the opponent's half or deep into their half as much as possible um and so what I'd actually love to see would be a return of forcing the engagement in the center. Yeah. Um, so I would drop reckoning, not because reckoning is bad, but because I have to drop one of them, but I like the other ones the most. Uh, uh -huh. And I would bring in extraction. So for those who weren't a fan of extraction uh, or, or didn't know what that was, that's where, you would place a 30 millimeter marker in the center of the board. And then at the end of the turn, uh, if you had at least two models within six inches, you would score a point. And then whoever had more models within six inches would get to move that marker, place it uh, three inches from its current position. And so the game was all about forcing the action to the center. You had to commit forces there. So it was killy, but the killiness was in one place. It helped favor the slower leader models that don't necessarily see as much good play in the current crop of schemes and strategies. So I think that would be an interesting way to affect crew building. I forgot about extraction. Oh, extraction was a good strat, um, and it was a strat that had layers to it that you didn't realize till like the fourth time you played it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure how we'd fit it into the like incrementally more harder aspect of this because like requiring more models would be yeah really tough. Um, but there's probably a way to do it. Well, and as much as I like that incremental nature that we see now, doesn't mean that that's where the guys need to stay, right? That's um, true. Yeah, yeah, they can. Like, I kind of miss a little bit the strategies where only one person scores it that is true which we don't which we don't have now um and i miss that a little bit which is by by scoring you're denying at the same time um so maybe putting that into the mix is something to think about so owen uh let's go to st uh schemes real quick um i'm not going to worry about replacing them just name two schemes that if they disappeared you wouldn't miss them all right so i i would love to get rid of uh the take prisoner and detonate charges. So why take prisoner? I just, it's such a difficult scheme to really achieve. Like you can get the first point some of the time and you could maybe surprise one point, but it, you're almost never going to get two unless you're already winning really hard or your yeah. opponents made a massive mistake. Um, and then detonate charges is kind of similar you're going to get it maybe once, but like getting another point, like that's going to be pretty tough. Um, I would love to see uh, a return of some variant of frame for murder. Uh, so either frame oh, for murder. Really? Another controversial pick. Yeah, take one for the team or frame for murder. Like one of the schemes, like when I first got into Malifaux, one of the huge selling points was like, look, you can even score points when your guys are getting killed. Yeah. Like, yeah. like that, that making people think twice before they kill that model that ran into your crew. Like, I think that added a lot of depth. Um, and I'd love to see that make a return. Yeah. Frame for murder was a, a controversial, um, a controversial scheme for a couple reasons. And I think some of them were legitimate, but boy, oh boy, you nailed it when you said it was something that was uniquely Malifo because there's there's been nothing like it since. Um, and uh, that's a good call. How about you, Josh? What are one or two schemes that you would uh, throw off the island? I am 
really just not a fan of Harness the Leyline. I think it's boring. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it's just like, oh, we crap out a bunch of markers. So we'll bring our marker crapping out tech and just spam stuff in the center line. It's, it's just not very fun. Well, how, how many iterations of this are we going to see now, right? I mean, we've seen some version of this. What This is like at least the fourth or fifth iteration. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to get rid of it because it, it's, it's borderline iconic at this point. But yeah. uh, just, it's just boring. It's just boring. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Uh, and the other that I am not really a fan of is Claim Jump. Again, it's so awkward to accomplish that it's very rarely worth taking. Uh, there are certain models that that can pull it off, but even though it's sort of telegraphed pretty well. Um, so I think it's just awkward enough that you see it in the pool and you just sort of go past it without caring, and that's and that's not what I want out of a out of a scheme. It's something that I'm always just being like, well, not going to take that. Right. Yeah. It's 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 the immediately eliminate. Um, and the only times I've ever taken claim jump myself was when I was forced to. When I was just you know because of the crew that was being selected, I was like, shit. My only choice is claim jump, and I've got to figure out how the hell I'm going to try to get at least a point out of this. Um, yeah, schemes where the opponent has so much agency are, are tough. Mm-hmm. They're tough, and they're and they're a lot less appealing. So I can see that. Well, gentlemen, I, th- I really enjoyed this. Um, I wish that uh, the counter section was an hour longer than it was, but uh, <laughs> I'll take what I can get. Um, oh, I'm really looking forward to uh, this weekend, man. Um, uh, it'll it'll be fun. Uh, be fun seeing you and Jeff and uh, Josh. We got to figure out either uh, next time I'm up, we're going to catch some beers, uh, or when you come down here. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. And uh, for those of you listening, thanks for sticking around. Take care. Be sure to check out our shop on thirdfloorwars.com for the latest gaming apparel and gear. While you're there, check out how the USFO Tour is shaping up. How does your conference compare to the others in the United States? Where do you rank nationally? Get those models built, painted, and on the table so we can see you at the U.S. Masters Invitational in October of 2020. Also, rate and write a review on this podcast for us. It really helps us find people almost as cool as you are. Thanks for listening. Howdy, friend. Craig here. Is this episode making you realize you need to buy some models? Gadzooks Gaming is my favorite online retailer because of their large selection, killer prices, and great customer service. Don't you hate buying an entire crew box when you only need one model? Gadzooks sells crew box models individually and saves you a ton of money. They even have free shipping to the U.S. and Canada if you spend $100 or more. Swing by gadzooksgaming.com and make sure you tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. All the details are in the show notes. Uh, that seems good. Are there, is there a place to just view them? Oh, okay, there we go. Yep. Got it. Ooh. I can use the app. Hey. <laughs> I got a podcast you can listen to if you can't. I, I um, listen to that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> L- let me jump in here. What we really want to do is is pick the two best. Yeah. Um, so we're not going to go through each one. Um, so, uh, and that can be either yeah, I'll let you guys decide who wants to cover it, or one of you cover one, another one cover the other. Um, but I really want to try to help focus it and keep in context of not that you know you're soloing Levy and have to take him into everything, but yeah. he, Levy's competing with other Outcast Masters. So, w- where does Levy become the pick? Got yep. it. And I yep. think all right, reckoning and turf war. Okay, so I'll start with you then, uh, Owen, because we started with Josh last. Is that good? Mm-hmm. Sure. Oh, do you think it's worth mentioning the scavengers because they're awesome? I, I do. I think they're pretty sweet. We should. Yeah. Um, is there a potential uh, potential to mention them in the context of a strategy or scheme? Yeah, uh, I think so. Okay, let's do that. Let's work them in there. Cool. It was good, ladies. <laughs> uh, one question for you. Oh, God damn it, Owen. You're so fucking difficult. <laughs> Can you, is the mic picking up my cat, like losing no. his shit? Okay. All right. No, I would have said something. You're good. Right, cool. He's like, meow, 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 yeah. Yeah, have you tried feeding him? That's, I've heard that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Like, to what? Do we want to talk about the amalgam keyword mechanic? Like the entropy and unmaking, sort of as. Or do you want to just uh, go model by model? Yeah, let, uh, we can work it in, right? Okay. Um, 
you know, just make sure that when we talk about it with a model where it's really important that we make it clear that's something you see everywhere Got it. Okay. and call, call it out when it's needed. Got it. All right. So core crew. Got it. Okay. You guys are cranking it the fuck out. I like it. All right, cool. What are we at? Are we 50 um, minutes. All right. Uh, yeah, we're doing good. We'll, we'll, no. we'll get this on. We'll get this under a buck 30. That's good. Cool. Cool. <laughs> what were you going to say, Josh? No, I was, I was, I was going to ask how long we were, we were planning on. I've had three hour deep dives. I've had hour long deep dives. So that was a good one too. What was that? Um, fuck. Oh, uh, uh, shit had Travis loved that one. He always put that into his pools. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. I don't, um, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, but no, back to what you're saying, Owen. I'm trying to think of some old schemes that didn't make it in. So it's There's like a lot pub- of shitty schemes that didn't like make it in. Public executions and hunting. Oh, yeah. Public execution. Yeah. I like public execution. That was fun. All right, cool. Cool. Um, so, Josh, we'll start with you. You're going you're gonna to pick a strategy that – of the four strategies, which one, if it went away, you wouldn't miss it? And is there something you'd love to bring back, even if it's a core mechanic or something or a, an angle um, that would fill the gap uh, that you left there that you don't see in the other three? Okay? Okay. Uh, 